Okay, Chair, we're now live on YouTube, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome everyone to this meeting. Uh, this meeting is also being broadcast live on YouTube. Uh, to ensure smooth running of the meeting, I would like I would like to ask that all mobile phones are switched to silent or turned off, please. I would also like to ask that everyone keeps their microphone muted when not speaking. Okay. Uh, the meeting will operate in the following way. The development control manager will introduce each item relating to applications and summarize the main points. Members of the public who have registered to speak will then be invited to address the committee one at a time, and members of the committee will have the opportunity to clarify any points raised during their address. Once all the public speakers have com completed their statement, the, de the development control manager or appropriate person will respond to points made. Members of the committee will be given the opportunity to ask further questions regarding the application. Members of the committee will make any comments they wish to regarding the application. Once all matters have been thoroughly debated, I will ask the committee to vote on the application based on the recommendations in the report. Should a member lose their connection, I will adjourn the meeting whilst we try to get them back into the meeting to ensure that they have heard all the relevant facts before making the final decision. Members have been given a number to use to contact Democratic Services if they experience any technical difficulties. As this meeting is expected to be a long one, I will offer comfort breaks at the appropriate time. Right, item one on the agenda, apologies for absence, are there any? I haven't received any, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, notifications from members of the public to address the meeting. The following people have registered to speak on item 6A, uh, all are speaking against the, the application. That's Helen Amys on behalf of her client, Urban and Client, and Councillor Michael Page of Wellington, Weldon Parish Council. Uh, the following people have registered to speak on item 6A and are all speaking and are speaking for the application, Christian Smith and Charlie Tasker. Uh, the following person has registered to speak on item 6B, uh, speaking for the application, Paul Carey. Right. Uh, next, item three, declaration of members' interests, if any. Are there any members' interests that need to be declared that are not already on the re members' register of interests? No. There appear to be none. Chairman. Uh, Count, so, um, just, um, I, I don't think it's a, a problem, but... Uh, I was uh, involved with the uh, Prize Hall application, which is uh, just next door to the non-ferrous recycling, um, but um, uh, not wasn't involved with uh, this uh, application uh, at East Northampton Council. Sorry. Uh, right. Next, declaration of whip, if any. I can state that there is no whip being imposed by the Conservative group. Uh, is there any whip being imposed by any other political group represented here? I can see the Labour member shaking his head. Right, that brings us on to Chairman's announcements, item four. Uh, should a member of the public lose their connection, uh, the pro following process will be followed. I will either move to the next mem next speaker or once, and then once, the, if they cannot rejoin, I'm afraid we will have to skip them. Uh, if they do manage to rejoin, I will allow them to speak at the next opportunity. Uh, if they're unable to reconnect completely, um, we, we will try to raise the points that they have moved uh, by co when they've consulted officers. Uh, should a member of the committee lose the connection, the following will be done. I will pause the meeting to attempt to reconnect the member. <coughs> if after a reasonable length of time the member is unable to rejoin, the meeting will, con will continue on the assuming it is still quiet. If a member is unable to, if a member is, to, is able to rejoin later, they will not be able to 
participate or vote on the item where they miss part of the uh, presentation and speaking. Right, item five, minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of November, 2020. Um, Councillor Walters, are you waving your hand, are you? No, he said no. Um, can, is there, is it your wish that we approve these minutes as a correct and true record of the meeting? Yeah, agreed. Is there a seconder for that? Uh, that's been seconded. All those in favour, please unmute your microphones and say aye. 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 Right. Is there anybody against that motion? That motion is carried. Right. That brings us on to uh, county, county Council planning applications. And I'll start with item 6A, uh, which is uh, the non-ferrous recycling facility. Uh, Mr. Watson, would you like to present your report and summarise the issues? Thank you, Chairman. Just adjust my screen slightly. So, uh, yeah, Chair, this is an application for construction of a non ferrous recycling facility, including the construction of two uh, number fire water storage tanks, pump house, office mess quarter cabin, uh, attenuation pond and dust extraction system. And it's at the former Kirby Lodge IVC facility. That's an in-vessel composting, just mm -hmm. to make that clear, uh, at Gretton Brook Road, Weldon. We do have some plans to show the location of the development, which we sent out in the pack to you, but maybe quickly just have a look at those. If that's okay, Chair. So that's the... Um, red line application plan you can see the blue line is the is a slightly bigger area which is the the whole of the the site if you like that previously um or that makes up the 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 actual sort of kirby lodge farm uh, complex um the access road is obviously the thin narrow road and the buildings are uh, located in the more larger rectangular area and you can see some buildings already located the access point is off the Great Book Road. It's um, it's on a on the outside of a bend. It's been accepted in the past by the Highway Authority, and all traffic approaches the the site to and from the west. So they don't go north south along the Great Brook Road. But they approach it from the west, and that takes them into the industrial areas at, at uh, Corby. That's the approach shows that 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 taken and that the, the applicant is willing to agree to in, in respect of this development as well. Mm -hmm. We move on to the next plan. It's a, that's a bit of a blow up to show the the site as a whole. The there's the various buildings there. Uh, you can see one that's coloured in in blue, hatched in blue. Uh, and then there's a grey building, and then in between there's a there's a narrow strip with a long grey uh, feature in it. That, that's supposed to represent a vehicle. So what happens is that materials would be brought into the area in the middle, and uh, vehicles would back in and and drop the vehicle the waste up materials off there. They would then be taken into the the grey coloured shed, which is on the on the south side of the map of that uh, plan where they would be go through the recycling process <coughs> and they would be moved to the blue area once they'd be stored in bags and moved into the blue area to be stored before going off for other recycling uses. There is very other things annotated on the plan. You'll have had a chance to look at those chair. I think we've got another plan, which I'm not sure if it came out with you this time. It was in the pack we think that came out at the last committee. It shows the ecological enhancement plan for the site. So you can see that in the wider blue area, there is some planting to be done on the area near the Gretton Brook Road. There's an area of, of landscaping that's being put forward as part of this proposal, as part of the ecological enhancement, and the area of managed tussocky grassland as well that will be managed. So this has been uh, considered as part of the proposal and and taken on board. 
there's already um, a embankment around the east and the south side of the site. So this site is, is set well down. And in fact, the buildings can't be seen from the public highway, which is called Kirby Lane, which you can just see on the south side of the plan, which runs along east-west past the development. Because that, that bund has also already got some planting on it, which has well shielded the actual development as a whole. Yeah, there's no questions on the plans, I can move on. Turning to the report. The report outlines the history for you in paragraph 2.1. You can see it started in, in 2007 when this investor composting and wood chipping facility was first approved. It was extended in 2008 and then there's been various variations or additional plan added to it since 2009 and 2013. And the facility was operational taking 40,000 tonnes per annum, uh, or had a permission for 40,000 tonnes, but it stopped receiving biodegradable waste at the end of March 2020. And the, the site licence has, under, the site has undergone thorough clean and, and uh, from the former operator team, W Composting, and they've submitted an application to surrender the permit to the Environment Agency, and I believe that's gone through. It just the point that we, we made there is that the nearest residential properties at Priors Hall Park did complain about odour and flies generated by that facility in the past, uh, most notably during warm weather periods. The site description, which, which we've had a, a look at the plans, but there's details in the report for you, uh, they're covered. So moving on just to the proposal, a little bit more detail in paragraph 3.1. So this is a non-ferrous metals recycling facility designed to decontaminate non-ferrous metals such as beer cans, food containers, etc., which have previously been removed for the production of refuse derived fuel or solid recovered fuel. So it's, not, it's already been through a pre-treatment process and the other potential sources of feedstock could include waste from the incineration or biomass process. And the facility is proposed to process up to 16,000 tonnes per annum of feedstock. And the main processing recycling plant, it would consist of shredders, magnets, eddy currents, separators, trommel screens and conveyors to separate the sort and recover the material. And it was subsequently stored and recovered within the existing buildings. There's no extension to the building footprints proposed except for a modular type office and welfare facility for the staff and plant will process about approximately four tonnes per hour. There's more details then as well, Chair, about the processes, but that's the, that's the main crux of it. In terms of the representation, uh, beg your pardon, the um, consultations, uh, East Northamptonshire Council ha had no objection. But they did request that in determining the application, the Council have regards to the outline planning application for Zone 3 of Priors Hall Park, well, that has, has, since we've written the report, that has been to the East Northamptonshire Council Committee and has been approved. There's further details about that uh, covered in paragraph 2.4 of the, of the report. We also asked for the Environmental Health Officer's views at East Northamptonshire, bearing in mind particularly the previous history of the site and mm -hmm. the, there was some revised information provided and the, the ENC raised no objections to the revised noise and odour documents submitted by the applicant. Similarly, we consulted Corby Borough Council. They had no, no objection to the proposal. Um, they did request that the, the County Council pay particular attention to the concerns and the comments raised by the Environmental Health Officer. Uh, those were, were somewhat similar to the East Northamptonshire officers and that was, they needed to see further information to satisfy them that the Applicant, application would be appropriately, and the development would be appropriately managed. And following consideration of the further information provided by the applicant regarding air quality and emissions and the mitigation proposed, the environmental health were happy to accept the proposals. Uh, they did want um, some limitation on the construction working hours. There were objections, Chair, raised by Weldon Parish Council there in paragraph 4.8. Uh, there's a lot of detail there for you, which we'll have read. They raised points about the impact on Priors Hall Park, 
they mentioned the previous issues of vermin, flies and odour and were worried that this proposal could, ha could have a, uh, any similar uh, implications. And there were a, a number of other matters they raised, such as leachate storage, noise and the like. Uh, Gretton Parish Council also objected uh, and they were concerned about the traffic, increased noise from, from the traffic as well um, as they approached the site along Grettenbrook, oh, the village along Grettenbrook Road uh, and therefore they were concerned about that. We also had an objection from Dean and Dean Thorpe Parish Council that's in the report. They were concerned about any contaminated water being discharged into the brook. HGVs, they didn't want them any way through the village. Well, I've already explained that that wouldn't be uh, the intention and it would be control. And noise and light pollution were also mentioned. Now, in view of all the concerns in the past about this site, we, we had a, a further dialogue with the Environment Agency in relation to this particular matter with the applicant. And they required an odor, odor management plan to be submitted so we have dealt with that and the EAA are satisfied uh, at this stage that the odour management plan is adequate uh, and they also accept that the fly management plans that were put forward by the, proposal, by the applicant as part of their proposals. And they consider those satisfactory to address their original concerns on the application and they withdrew their initial holding objection. We did also consult with Public Health England um, they were of a view that the environmental health would review the, the issues and that it would also be controlled in the environmental permit uh, and had no issues in relation to, to their position. As I said, Highway Authority had no objections subject to the appropriate routing. We did have objections from County Councillor Sandra Naden Hawley that's in paragraph 4.21 of the report. You will have seen that. And um, from Corby Borough Councillor Kevin Watts, mm -hmm. uh, that's in paragraph 4.22. We also had a total of 17 representations objecting to the application from, uh, including from the developers of Prize Hall Park. And one of the speakers uh, is representing Prize Hall Park, um, Urban and Civic of the Development Agency. In relation to the representations, the same sort of matters that I've already mentioned were raised, concerned about odour and flies, noise, proximity to the park, to the new park developments um, and the operational hours and a number of other points which are all listed in the report. So in, in relation to the assessment of this site, Chair, obviously the first thing to say is clearly this is an established waste site. Planning permission was granted as far back as 2007 uh, and those members who were able to visit the site will, would have seen that um, the buildings are currently vacant and uh, this development would obviously occupy and make use of this site and provide obviously uh, some employment. And in principle, the, the site is, is acceptable having regard to the minerals and waste development plan. But we obviously do have to consider the odor the, sorry, the amenity impacts included odour and flies, and I've explained to you how we address those and uh, the odour assessment and the odour assessment and fly management plan have been accepted by the Environment Agency and the Environmental Health Officers. Similarly, the noise information was submitted and the application would include a noise management plan, and that is considered to be an acceptable way to mitigate that impact as well. Uh, Dust and air quality, well, all the processes will take place inside. They've got a specific dust extractions, extraction uh, system that will be included, uh, and that would ensure that any dust would be controlled within the facility and not uh, exposed to the environment. In terms of landscape and visual impact, this site is well set down. Uh, there's additional landscaping proposed. So we don't see any issue there, Chair. Water resources and flood risk, those things were, some issues were raised about the impact on water, but this has all got a contained water drainage system that was installed for the Invesel composting facility. And that's, a, that's obviously uh, very helpful to the developers that they'll be able to utilize that as part of this proposal. So nothing will be, will be um, 
would be drained to the external watercourse into the brook. Uh, cultural heritage is also mentioned because Kirby Hall is 850 meters away, but this site isn't visible. It's operated in the past as, an, as the Invesco composting facility. And I don't believe there's been any, been any detrimental impact on Kirby Hall. And therefore there's nothing in, we believe that needs to be taken into account uh, in relation to this development. So yeah, that's a summary of the issues. Uh, clearly there may be other questions that members want to ask. And uh, at this stage, I think we'll, we ought to leave it there. Of course, the recommendation is that it ought to be approved, but clear, clearly members will want to debate the issue. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Right, now I'd like to move to the uh, public speakers. Uh, do we have a Helen Ames on behalf of uh, Urban and Civic? We do, Chair. Um, I'll just admit her to the meeting now. Uh, she has three minutes. Uh, Ms. James, you, if you unmute yourself, you have three minutes to speak to the committee. Chair, was that me you were referring to? Oh, arms, is it? Oh, sorry. It's arms. Um, oh, it's arms. My apologies. It's Miss Arms, yes. No problem. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Helen Arms, and I speak on behalf of Urban and Civic, who are the owners and developers of Prior's Hall Park lies immediately to the south of Kirby Lane in the proposed recycling facility. Urban Civic is a master developer with extensive experience, not just in building exceptional places, but in building sustainable communities. Prize Hall Park represents an investment in excess of 75 million pounds in North Northamptonshire alone, and when complete, will comprise a garden community of about 15,000 people. The development will deliver several schools, local shops and services, and extensive areas of green space and wildlife habitat. Zone one of the development is nearing completion, and as you heard last month, East North Hants Council and Corby Borough Council unanimously approved a new outline application for three and a half thousand homes in zones two and three, with zone three lying closest to the recycling centre. In view of this substantial investment, Urban and Civic is naturally concerned about the proximity of the proposed metal recycling facility, which in some places is less than 300 metres away. This concern is increased because the site has a history of odorous and noisy activity and during the operation of the previous composting facility, Urban and Civic, along with neighbouring parishes, heard repeated complaints from home homeowners and residents about fly infestations and bad smells, particularly during hotter weather when windows are left open and residents want to use their gardens. Whilst Urban and Civic recognise the importance of facilities for waste recycling, we must therefore question the compatibility of such an activity so close to a large resident population. We also question whether appropriate measures are included in the application to mitigate the potential impact of this activity. We understand that on arrival, waste metal will be contaminated with food and drink and other packing materials, which will constitute 30% of the processed material. After separation, we understand that the food waste will be stored outdoors prior to removal from the site. And as far as we can ascertain, there is no time limit for the storage of this waste and the proposal provide no certainty that this food will be packaged or covered when it leaves the building for the outdoor storage pens. And consequently, we are alert to the possibility of yet more malodorous rotting food waste and the inevitable fly infestations that will follow. Furthermore, we question um, whether sufficient safeguards have been put in place to prevent problems arising shaped. This requires sealed storage tanks with appropriate venting arrangements and cautious removal of affected water from site to avoid contamination of local watercourses and further unacceptable odours and flies. The proposals offer us no comfort in this regard. So finally, we question whether adequate measures have been put in place to monitor future noise levels at the boundary of the site with provision for further mitigation in the event that these exceed acceptable noise levels. Again, we question the strength of the protection to be afforded to the local community. Therefore, we ask the committee to refuse the application. However, if the committee is minded to approve the application, we seek a deferment so that the applicant can provide concrete reassurances on all of the points raised and appropriate conditions put in place to prevent further bad neighbour development, which as local residents know only too well can be a source of constant misery and worry leading to ongoing complaints. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Arms. 
Uh, the next speaker is Councillor Michael Page of Welland Parish Council. Is Councillor Page available? Uh, um, he's not in the waiting room, unfortunately. I have um, emailed him this morning to make sure he's got the correct details, but I haven't heard back from him. Okay, can we move then to Christian Smith? Okay, I'll just move uh, Ms. Arms back to the waiting room. And I'm admitting Christian Smith now, Chair. Smith. Uh, I'll just move Ms. Arms back to the waiting room. And I'm admitting Christian Smith now, Chair. Uh, Christian Smith, we can hear you but not see you. Um, yeah. You have three minutes to speak. Smith. Uh, yes. I'll just move arms back to the waiting room. Mr. Smith, if you have YouTube playing in the background, could you pause it, please, as we can hear you going? Christian Smith yeah. now, Chair. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? We can, yes. You have right. three minutes. Good morning. Um, my name's Christian Smith. I'm uh, the planning agent on behalf of the applicant DMP Metals. Uh, I have alongside me, virtually at least, the project director, um, Charlie Tasker, uh, who will be following me. I, I don't want to go over the points presented by Mr. Watson, but I think it's important to emphasise that in principle and in planning policy terms, this proposal fully complies with the locational requirements of the waste local plan, of course, subject to the environmental impacts being acceptable. The applicant fully understands the local concerns raised in relation to the site's previous use as a composting facility, particularly concerns raised about flies and odour. I don't want to dwell on the previous composting operation as it's important to focus on the merits of the application before you today, but there is a significant difference between the two operations, mainly that the former composting operation stored considerable volumes of biodegradable waste material in various stages of decomposition for long periods. Much of this material was stored outside making it difficult to control odours. In contrast to that position, the type of waste proposed to be handled at the site will not be biodegradable. No material, either feedstock or process material, will be stored outside of the buildings, and there'll be a maximum of a two-day turnaround of processing feedstock materials. So on a first-in, first-out basis, making the potential for any odours and fly numbers developing extremely unlikely. There's no objection, as Mr. Watson pointed out, from statutory consultees such as the Environmental Health Officer, the Environment Agency and the Highway Authority that were satisfied that the robust assessment work that's been presented, together with a suite of mitigation measures, will prevent the operation from becoming a source of nuisance in the locality. The applicant is committed to making sure that the operations do not have an adverse impact on the local community and has an open door policy to address any issues that need dealing with. I'd like to thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, as needed. Thank you, Chair. I don't see any members signalling they want to ask any questions. Uh, oh, Councillor Jill Mercer. Thank you. Um, you said um, there wouldn't be anything stored outside. Will the uh, areas be secured in terms of uh, sort of sealing up the uh, um, uh, outside uh, from the, the building. For instance, at the back of the building, there's quite an open area at the moment in the centre. Um, and uh, I'm uh, interested to see whether that would be closed up. Uh, can you still hear me? We can still hear you, Mr. Smith. Yeah, sorry, it's a bit difficult when I can't uh, can't see myself. Um, but basically, there'll be no material 
um, stored outside of the building. So material that's recycled will be transferred into the uh, hall, which was the blue building that uh, Mr. Watson pointed out on the diagram. So all of the material will be stored uh, ready for uh, removal from the site in, in, in bulk loads. So material will be simply moved from the recycling plant area to the, uh, the building to the north and stored there for, for, for ready for exportation from the site. Councillor Kilbride, you were signalling. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, where you've got watercourses and brooks, you get rats. Where you get foodstuffs inside of buildings, you get rats. What policies in place to keep uh, rodents at bay? Yeah, thank you. So um, there are, we have prepared, uh, there's, there's two regulatory regimes here. There's the planning act, there's a the planning process and there's the environmental permit process. So what, we, what, we're, what we're in the process of doing is as part of the uh, planning application, we've prepared a, a suite of assessment work, which has identified issues um, such as you just raised, uh, Mr. Kilbride, and we've provided um, a whole package of mitigation measures, which will deal with any issues that arise. The, permit application, which has all of the um, pollution related um, uh, uh, measures in, in it, alongside the planning application, has been submitted to the Environment Agency, and, and that's at a fairly advanced stage. So uh, we're, we're confident that the, that the uh, management um, of, the pro of the proposal uh, and the mitigation measures, which will be controlled through the planning application and the permit, will prevent any sort of pests uh, or any other nuisances arising and can be adequately dealt with by the, uh, by the management of the, uh, of the operations. Does that satisfy your question, uh, Councillor Kilbride? It does. Uh, I would have liked to have seen those measures, uh, but obviously I appreciate that's for another agency. Okay, are there any further questions for Mr Smith? Councillor Ty? <coughs> Uh, thanks very much, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, Christian, our first speaker, Helen Arms, um, spoke quite strongly about um, <clears throat> uh, being a representative of the Prize Hall uh, residents. And one of the things she said was, <clears throat> she's seeking, obviously, cast iron guarantees uh, about the fact that, uh, as you said, there won't be smell or flies or noise, in what way can you guarantee that that will be the case, that there will be a guarantee that this will not occur? And I know what you might well say, well, it's down to the environmental agency, but it's really a question then of whether they will implement um, uh, the withdrawal of the license to do all this. Thank you. Um, I think the, the answer to the question really is that this, this operation um, is firstly significantly different, uh, as I said, to the previous one. There is, there is in place, and there's going to be in place, a whole series of a schedule of planning conditions within which all of the mitigation measures uh, uh, and the permit uh, will, will re require the operator to conduct and operate this facility in accordance with those mitigation measures. And they are, um, you know, on a daily basis, the operator will be, will be managing and, and assessing uh, any, any potential issues that arise and adapting accordingly. So th the operator takes it very seriously, very responsibly, their role within the local community here and will will basically take appropriate actions and measures to prevent the facility becoming uh, 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 or giving rise to any issues in the locality. So the, the point is there are measures in place as with, all, with any development to control uh, any adverse impact and that that developer then 
will have to uh, adapt accordingly. So mm. We're not envisaging in this operation uh, any, any issues in relation to odour, flies, um, uh, any, any sort of impacts that the previous, the previous operation obviously was a problem. And it was a problem for the reasons that I was outlining that this, that, that particular facility was, was storing large quantities of biodegradable waste outside for many weeks at a time. And that made it a very difficult operation to manage. Um, and, but, but by comparison, this is a completely different feedstock. It is not biodegradable waste. And it's going to be far, far easier to manage you can control this development in relation to its impacts on the locality which are at, at minimum 250 meters away Does that answer your question uh, councillor toy uh yes chairman uh just about it's just from my experience really chairman of um uh, a recycling place uh within my division and um, most of the materials there, almost all of them, are non-biodegradable, but they still have the same problem because of the washing that's required, which, is, which at the time was insufficient to uh, get rid of flies and things like that. And it was a long running uh, fiasco to try and get this done. What I'm trying to do is to, to be satisfied with the information that was given that would actually satisfy Helen Armson, that was all. So time will tell, and at the end of the day, it'll be down to, I guess, the, uh, the grantors of the licence, what they do about it, if it starts to go wrong. But I Thank won't you, say more about <clears throat> Councillor Gilmer, sorry. Thank you. Um, the feedstock that's uh, going into uh, this uh, operation uh, is mostly described as uh, beer cans and, and things like that that are going to be chopped up. But um, I, uh, there's also um, a proposal to uh, deal with other residual waste from um, sort of biomass plants. Uh, but that doesn't seem to uh, accord. It, it seems to be two different operations. I, I can't see how they can um, have the equipment. Um, I was on the site visit. It's quite a uh, restricted area. It would have it had to be two completely separate processes for those two different types of uh, feedstock. Yes, so perhaps I could just provide some clarification around this point. Um, the the option to take um, metals that have been through a incineration process could not be taken directly to this facility for processing. The environmental permit application that the applicant has applied for to the environment agency and on the basis upon which this planning application is submitted is, is to receive non-hazardous material. So in order for any uh, non-ferrous metals to be recovered from an incineration process, that material would have had to have first gone through a sort of contamination cleanup uh, process to remove, to remove any contaminants so that the, the, where if, if on the basis that that material was received to site, it would already have been cleaned up and uh, is, is, it will be therefore of a non-hazardous nature. So it is, it is true to say that material at the back end of a, um, an incineration process will not be delivered to this site. And, and added to that point is that the uh, bespoke recycling plant could not handle uh, <coughs> that, that type of material. Does that help you help with your question? So you're saying it, it won't take that other type of material? Not, not without having gone through another process which, which um, would have to be done elsewhere. There's no proposals whatsoever to have a secondary or, or, or 
uh, a process by which other materials would be cleaned up on this site. So it's important for me to stress that any material that comes to the site um, would, it's already been through a, a, a clean up and a, a previous processing facility um, uh, before it could be allowed to be, to be delivered to this site. That's an issue that members will um, discuss when all the public speakers have uh, finished. Are there any further questions for Mr. Smith? Uh, have we got uh, Councillor Michael Page yet? We, we do indeed, Chair, yes. Ah, can, can we bring him in now then, please? Just move Mr. Smith to the waiting room and I'll bring in Ms., uh, Councillor Page. Okay, Councillor Page is just joining the meeting now, Chair. Yeah, we're still waiting. Uh, um, Councillor Page, you're currently muted. You need to unmute before. Ah, Councillor Page, uh, you're online now. You okay. have three minutes to address the committee. Could you give us one minute? I need to uh, stop my streaming. One second, please. <clears throat> Right. Okay, please give me, bear with me one more second, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, committee. Thank you, chair. I'm ready to start. Price Hall Park have lived with the misery of the previous incumbents <clears throat> for four long years until the EA finally got their act together due to the pressure through considerable effort, struggle and the personal intervention of councillors and also our MP Tom Perslow. The previous operator realised the facilities included the shed and the collection and storage of lead shape were just not fit for purpose and the essential improvements to protect residents <clears throat> made their operation actually here unviable. So they left. I have tried to put myself into your shoes here. This is a proposed waste processing operation on a previously consented site. And I appreciate that strategic policies mean there is a need for this somewhere. So there is probably a strong case to approve, though sensitivity is significantly higher now. People here are not NIMBYs, but we do expect this facility will not affect the quiet enjoyment of our homes. The primary concerns here are smells, noise and light pollution. And from the report, I believe the officer wants to be thorough and to address the objections raised. But however, our deep concerns remain as follows. That waste material storage, the assertion being that the new operation will store material for a much shorter time, so less impact in terms of odour, flies, etc. But there is no mention of leachate, the concentrated superadding liquid produced by the decaying food and other organic matter, how it's collected, stored and disposed of. And how is this being addressed in their proposals? In the existing setup, it drains into open channels into an underground tank. And we believe this was a big attraction for flies and vermin. You've also, the, the tank actually related, relating to the, uh, the shed is not even shown on the, on the plans. The leachate tank that is shown relates to the open air areas. So that appears to be completely missed here. And leachate should not be in open air anyway. We visited the site when it was working and I personally pointed out the venting from the underground storage tank should be filtered. Similarly displaced air when pumped out of a tanker for disposal on off site. It was not fit for purpose before and we believe this has actually been overlooked in these proposals. There are recognised ways of neutralised le leachate. There is an absolute need for this to be carefully considered and addressed. As far as noise is concerned, the predicted noise impacts against ambient are stated. But how are you ensuring the operator demonstrates that there is no performance gap between the design intent and the operational reality here? We propose specific noise criteria are set at the boundary, maybe at the bund, so that the operator is clear what is needed 
before they actually invest any further on this site. In summary, residents don't want to go through the pain again with everyone that involves, nor does anyone want to see the, the EA's precious resource tied up with dealing with an avoidable problem. If you are minded to approve, we ask that members defer this decision and insist on the applicant having direct engagement with neighbours and with the EA to develop a robust plan to ensure that this installation is built right first time. Or to know now if the necessary upgrades mean their business plan actually doesn't work for this location. This is a matter for the mental health and well-being of numerous people. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Page. Uh, are there any questions from uh, members of the committee for Councillor Page? None. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker we have is uh, uh, Charlie Tasker. Is Charlie Tasker in the waiting room? No. Right. Uh. Mr. Tasker, you're muted. Right, you are now right. unmuted. You have three minutes to address the committee. Yes, good morning. Thanks for giving me time to speak. Uh, I think my colleague, uh, uh, Christian Smith, has actually covered most of the points and answered the questions. However, I'd like to point out um, that this, this development represents a five million investment in the local community uh, into the Corby area, and it will create a number of jobs directly and indirectly as a result of that. Um, part of our philosophy within uh, the DMP Stroke Groundworks organization is to seek to employ local contractors for construction, uh, is to seek local people to run the plant, and, and I think that, that that has to be borne in mind when considering the application. Um, I want to specifically address uh, some of the points uh, that were uh, raised uh, regarding noise by, by Michael Page. Um, we do have strict noise criteria in the design. All the plant is enclosed within a building and we've actually delivered a noise model that shows that there'll be no measurable noise uh, level at the nearest receptor. Um, we have also put in place obviously noise measuring uh, requirements around the boundary to demonstrate during construction that we will not um, exceed the limits set by the planning authority. So we, we are quite confident that the noise levels that we've predicted in the modelling uh, can be achieved at all times. Um, furthermore, if, if there were any um, deviations from that noise levels, um, you know, we have actually decided to install acoustic hoods on certain elements of the equipment that they will be inserted on, installed on site. These acoustic hoods will help reduce that noise levels further. Um, and we also have, there are options to improve any, any uh, you know, the building structure if any noise issues did arise at a future date. So I think the, the noise uh, issues, um, if there was something that was unforeseen, we could address those at a later date as part of the operational control of the site. Um, I'd also like to address the leachate tank. Um, leachate is, is formed primarily in composting and it comes from the, the, the degrading of the, uh, the, the, the waste. Um, and that's where the leachate that was being um, derived on the site previously um, was captured and taken away by tanker. Um, leachate on this site will not, there'll be no leachate in fact, because the, um, the, the is no water being added to the process. And of course the, the plant will, the materials will not be on site long enough for there to be any um, water to, to, uh, to run out into the drainage system. However, there is a tank at the back of the building, as has been stated. That tank captures all water. And if it was proven not to be suitable for discharge into the on-site drainage system, then that can be tankered away um, uh, uh, by arrangement. So we will be testing the water that's coming into that drainage tank and making sure that it is um, suitable for disposal to the, the on-site drainage system. Um, I think the, the questions that have been asked um, of Mr. Smith, I think, 
covers uh, most of the points that I wish to raise. Um, and therefore, I'm just opening up to any further questions from the committee uh, so I can uh, provide further answers. Are there any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Tomska? I don't. Oh, Councillor Jill Mercer. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think one of the concerns of, uh, for instance, Gretton uh, Parish Council was the hours of operation. They do seem uh, very long so till 10 o'clock at night or, um, and uh, six days a week. Um, so, um, you, you know, obviously that's why residents will be concerned because that's uh, very late. Um, is, is there a reason why you know, there's such long working hours? Yeah, the, the, the reason we've got, um, it's a two shift operation. So we'll have a morning shift and a, and a late shift uh, for, for the processing. Um, however, there are controls in place that, that will exclude any deliveries or materials leaving site after um, before seven in the morning or after seven at night. So all of the operation is indoors. Um, the, um, there will be strict controls that doors are kept shut at all times during the operation. Um, and therefore the noise um, mitigation measures will, will perfectly, will I think attenuate any risk of noise being heard at the, the local uh, receptors. Um, Other question? Yes, you um, you say about the um, uh, there'll be uh, so everything being closed. I know the central part where the the feedstock comes in, where the the vehicles come in. At the moment, it's open at the back. Presumably, that's going to be closed off. Is it? That's correct. We, the, the proposals show that um, the the rear of the building being closed off um, with similar cladding to the existing building, and also inside that there'll be the similar type concrete push walls that you probably saw on the site visit to offer that noise attenuation at the rear of the building. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you say that the noise will be modelled ongoing because uh, one of the uh, uh, Corby Borough Council mentioned that it was sort of a theoretical um, modelling um, and that uh, sort of in practice when it's actually going on that you'll keep, keep control of that noise. That, that's correct. We, we, we see ourselves as, as being, you know, we want to be transparent and we want to share with the local community. So any noise um, issues that there are reports, we will thoroughly investigate those and, and share those reports with the community. And if there is anything untoward that, that's causing uh, concerns, we will look at how we can uh, provide further mitigation. So will there be a, a mechanism for uh, residents to interface with you? There, there, there will be. There'll be within the, the environmental permit. Um, there has to be a, a process where um, residents can uh, um, fill in a form with any complaints, either regarding noise, flying nuisance, or, or or odor, and those have to be thoroughly investigated by the operator uh, and the operations team. Um, but they will also be putting in their own controls on a daily basis, which will actually control feedstock coming to site to check there's no feedstock that doesn't meet our strict acceptance criteria, um, which is set out within the environmental permit. Um, we will be looking to see if there, you know, there are any potential fly, um, you know, lava coming in on this feedstock and treat it if required. Um, and noise, we'll be looking at daily noise testing ourselves just to a walk around site to make sure that there are, is no noise um, levels at the boundary that could cause residents any concern. Thank you. Are there any further questions from members of the committee? Uh, Councillor Lawman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Task um, just said it's a two um, shift offshore, operation, but in paragraph 6.11 uh, of our report, it says that it will operate initially on a single shift of 2,000 hours with an option to extend. So um, is it likely to be two shifts from the start or um, is there to be uh, some delay in that for assessment? Uh, yeah, but I should clarify that. Yeah, we initially we are looking to uh, commence on a single shift, um, on, on a day shift only, and then within six months to, to eight months, um, move to a two shift operation. <clears throat> Councillor Kilbride, you were waving your hand. So have you got another further question? 
No question. I just couldn't quite hear it because someone was talking in the background on the phone. Okay. Are there any further questions by anybody? Okay, thank you, Mr. Tasker. We um, have no further questions for you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, right. We've been going now for an hour. Uh, does everybody? Does anybody need a comfort break at this point? Okay, Councillor Ty's got his hand in the air. Well, I need I, to open my back, my double gates at the back. I'm having a delivery, and I forgot to do it. So right, I'm only going to disappear for 30 seconds. Well, well I'll yeah. call a, a break for five minutes just to yeah. be on the safe side. So anybody who needs a comfort break can get one. So we'll, re we'll restart at 11 o'clock. Yeah, can I just remind everyone to turn off their cameras and microphones during the break, please? Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. 
I think the two, five minutes is going to stretch a bit. Your gates are now open, are they, Michael? Yeah. We're still waiting for councillors Breeze Kilbride. Oh, we've got Ke Breeze Kilbride and uh, Walters, I believe. We now have Councillor Kilbride back. We're waiting for Councillors Breeze and Waters. We have Councillor Breeze back. We're waiting for Councillor Waters. Mm. Councillor Jill Mercer, could you give a quick phone call to Councillor Waters and suggest he gets back? Councillor Waters actually was on the screen for most of the time when everyone else was not. Um, it just he went to, to his comfort break late, you're saying? Possibly, yes. He was on the screen, but he wasn't looking at us. Yes, yeah, but he wasn't. And you just right, Jim, we had the same thing last time. Can we proceed? No, he's back now. Councillor yeah. Kilbride is not muted. And, uh, um. Yeah, just getting the tangerine. Right, we have everyone back now, I believe. Uh, we can now proceed. Um, at this stage, I'd like to ask uh, uh, the Democratic, uh, sorry, the Development Control Manager to if he has any uh, responses to what has been said by the members of the public. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, the main issues you've heard are relating to the immunity impacts, which is what I said in the, in the actual uh, report, were the things that we needed to consider. These issues principally are fly, noise and odour. I, I just initially point you to the conditions. Um, we do have conditions page 46, if you've got a paper copy, condition 20 um, and 21 relate to odour and flies. Well, 20, 20 deals with both and 20, mm -hmm. 21 deals with odour monitoring. So they are, I won't read them out, but the, the conditions were imposed related to the submissions that were made. And I think the point I wanted to make was that we spent a lot of time on this application seeking further confirmation and detail from both the Environment Agency and the Environmental Health Officers about the concerns that were raised, which we expected to be raised because of the previous activities on the site and, and the issues that that um, caused. And as I mentioned in my initial 
introduction, we did have a, a um, virtual meeting with the Environment Agency with the applicants to go through the sorts of information which they wanted to see for them to actually give us a, a, a view at the application stage, at the planning application stage, that they were satisfied that it wouldn't cause undue uh, impact in relation to odour flies in particular. And that's why further submissions were made and the, the application was, was delayed. The ap applicant had desperately wanted us to bring this forward two months ago, but we delayed it for further information uh, to be submitted. So there's a lot being done to guarantee, as far as we think we can go in planning, that matters have been properly addressed in this application and with the scheme submitted. And the same applies to noise, which I think is less of an issue in my view, because all the operations will take place within a, within a building. Uh, you've heard that the, that the processing plant, which is gonna be the noisiest part of the, of the operations, that can be totally enclosed. Uh, so there's no reason for this to generate significant noise you know, beyond the boundaries of the site. And we do, at any rate, have condition 16, which is on page 45, which ties the development to the noise levels in the revised noise assessment that was dated mm. July 2020. Uh, so I think that those things have been properly addressed. I just make one factual point for you in relation to the um, representation by Helen from Urban and Civic. You, you won't know, but we have had a, received a planning application for the quarrying of limestone from zone three of the um, Priors Hall Park. Uh, and clearly that has been, that, that would involve some, some um, immunity disturbance. And that actual application has been made by Urban and Civic. So clearly that, they're proposing an application for a quarry, which is, is relatively close to existing residential developments, but obviously opposing this development on the grounds of noise. So it's just a factual matter, which I think, you know, perhaps you ought to know. Uh, at the minute, we haven't validated that application. Can, can I just jump in there, if that's okay? Um, just, just to clarify that the statement that the um, planning officer is making is, is just a by way of background. It's not necessarily material consideration this application, if if I can make that clear for you, members, but it is something that is happening and it's just a relevant context, as it were. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Lyle. That's a good point. Yeah, I do totally accept that point. I'm not I'm not referring to suggesting that you take it into account as material consideration. <clears throat> so, Chair, yeah, I think that the we properly dealt with the um, the noise and the dust of the odour concerns and, and the leachate response was, was dealt with by the, um, by the applicant, uh, Mr. Tasker as well. But this, this isn't going to be stored outside. It's not going to leach in the same way as biodegradable wasted when it was in, in waste windrows. Mm -hmm. And therefore um, the amount of potential leachate is significantly vastly reduced from this process. I don't think I've ever got any other points, Chair, but obviously there may be questions for me. Okay, well, I'll start uh, with my comments. Um, I've had a, uh, an exchange of inf uh, telephone calls and emails with the development control manager concerning condition number three. If the uh, committee is minded to approve this, uh, I'm going to propose an additional sentence be added to the end of condition three. Uh, the additional sentence will be, no waste derived from incinerator bottom ash waste shall be imported to the site unless it has been, bought, been through appropriate pretreatment processes to clean and decontaminate the waste material to comply with the non-hazardous requirement. I, um, I have discussed it extensively with Mr. Watson, and that does seem a way of dealing with the issue that Councillor Jill Mercer was concerned about. Uh, I will uh, propose, if we are minded to grant this, that that 
amendment be made to condition three. After that comment, I open the meeting up for members to speak. Councillor Jill Mercer. Thank you. Um, we've heard a lot about it being uh, enclosed and therefore the noise will be, but uh, at 3.2, you mentioned that the tunnels would not be enclosed. Now, um, for members that went on the site visit, there is a sort of central uh, part where the feedstock will come in, in the vehicle, then it will be processed in the big sort of enclosed area. But I think those tunnels are for storage, am I uh, correct, uh, uh, Mr. Watson? And uh, but it, if um, you know if it's not sealed at that end, um, is that not going to potentially give noise as they're tipping the the uh, um, uh, process out? Unmuted. Sorry, Chair. Uh, yeah. Well, the understanding I have and and. Uh, I don't think there's any, I've got any reason to doubt this, is that the, the plant's materials will be in the large, sorry, the processing plant will be in the, in the main building and it will be dropped into piles or bags, uh, mainly bags, I believe, which will then just be transferred for storage in those tunnels. So other than the movement of materials into the tunnels, there won't be any 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 activities that would create noise. Uh, so okay. obviously, if they're loosely tipped, if they're loosely tipped into the into the tunnels, then there could be uh, some noise at the local level from the tipping of the materials. But um, they are they open to the north side, uh, and uh, they they can put some some shove walls against it. But the, at the minute, they're not proposing to totally enclose it. Okay. The other point that we haven't mentioned uh, so far is um, the uh, Public Health England mentioned aluminium dust and that uh, sort of uh, raised worries for me. Um, now, uh, the uh, dust extractor is 10 metres or approximately 10 metres high, but it's set um, so the, the bund is 6 metres high, which means that there'll be about four metres above uh, ground level when this, uh, the open end of the dust extractor is coming out. Is, is that dust extractor uh, going to collect uh, or is it being blown away into the air at the top of that dust extractor? It won't be allowed to do that. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm I don't know all the technical details, but it wouldn't put it into an extractor and then be allowed to, to um, release it to the atmosphere. No, the, the purpose of that extractor would be to control it and contain it. And it, if, if and when there's a, 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 an amount of residue in there, it would have to be appropriately bagged and taken away and dealt with. So no, they wouldn't be allowed under an environmental permit to release dust that they previously collected from the building into the atmosphere. I think um, you can rest assured the environmental permit would would guarantee Mr. Watson, it's not proposed. Can I c confirm for the audience and for the committee that um, uh, controlling the uh, dust, any dust leaving the site is a, a matter for the environmental environment agency rather than the planning matter? Can we just confirm that, please? Well, yeah, it's a pollution control matter, but I think I was just physically, uh, in terms of the physical process, I don't believe that it would likely to be released. Right, so we're responsible for the land use, but the pollution issues are not our responsibility. Um, as it happens from your description, there shouldn't be a pollution issue from it because there is a, a dust extractor and collector. But in any event, it's not something that we could use as reason for refusal because it's not a planning matter. Is that correct? If I can jump, jump in, Jay, yes, that, that, that summation of the situation is correct. Was that Mr. Alarve speaking? Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. So you've just confirmed what I said? Yes, Chair, yeah, just confirming that, that your understanding and summation of the situation is correct. Thank you, that is helpful, very helpful, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, uh, there was mention of the lighting, um, and um, one of the uh, councils, um, 
had it just a second ago, um, Dean and Dean Thorpe, um, suggested that it should be LED downlighting and energy efficient. We have a condition on lighting, but I didn't see anything about uh, it being, uh, you know, LED down, down uh, lighting, etc. Um, is that something that we perhaps ought to add into that condition? I was just going to check what the condition said, Chair. Yeah. Well, it requires a scheme to be submitted. So, I mean, obviously that could be something that we could put, put a, pick up in that scheme. Um, if you want it to include, that it should include LED lighting, because the, the, the second sentence of the scheme, of the condition does refer to uh, what it should include, then we could add that in. Yeah, if you're doing that, might as well put in that the lighting must be angled downwards as well. Uh, that would be um, reasonable with the, the current uh, interest in uh, uh, clearing the skies of unnecessary light pollution. We would, yeah, we, chair, uh, we can do that. We would ensure that that was picked up in relation to the lighting contours that they've got to submit, but yeah, that, that uh, can be added just as an extra assurance okay. that that's what they need to submit. Are there, uh, well, what, are the count, Councillor Ty, are you signalling? No. No. Are, are there other, oh, Councillor Kilbride. You're muted. Sorry, I, I'll have to go back to the previous uh, use of the site when it was a composting site. And, you know, obviously there was issues with older and flies there. And it took the agency a long time to get sacked together. I assume there was um, a control in place at the time that was granted. Is, is that correct or not? And if it was, why did it fail? I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to ask Mr. Watson. Yeah, the, 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 the controls for odour and flies were under the permit, which is the normal way. Uh, even with our conditions, clearly it will be the permit that will ultimately control the pollution control aspect. The agency spent a lot of time with the applicant endeavouring to seal all the potential sources of odour and um, deal with any issues relating to flies. Clearly, at the end of the day, the fact that this material was biodegradable included food, food waste, you know, in its raw sense, not, not, not related to just a slight, um, any slight uh, staining on a, on a can or anything. It included raw food that was taken in there. And therefore it was a completely different process. Uh, at the end of the day, they weren't able to satisfactorily mitigate and control it to the environment agency satisfaction so they took the appropriate steps to um to revoke well they didn't end up revoking the permit but they obviously in dealing with a company came to a position where the company moved to end their operation thank you does that answer your question councillor kilbride it, it does indeed thank you all right further comments from members councillor lawman um, so Thank you, Chairman. Just, just a question about the um, vehicle routing uh, condition nine, and I wonder whether there ought to be a specific about Gretton Book Road and Kirby Lane um, included so in that, um, those two roads included in that, rather than the um, just say minor road. So, so just to double check, we adding in, can you just repeat that? Add in what, um, please, Councillor Lawman? Well, rather than just say minor roads, to, to say actually have Gretton Book Road and Kirby Lane mentioned in there so that access yeah. is from Gretton Road itself only. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, could easily be added in. Would, um, Ms. Watson, uh, uh, would that be something that we would have an, a, prob a problem with the applicant might appeal against that, do you think? 
Well, I think the the the, the Grettenbrook Road um, restraint would have to be south from the site entrance because that is Grettenbrook Road. So they would only be able to use Grettenbrook Road to west of the entrance. Okay. Um, as long as you're content that that is a sustainable uh, amendment to the condition. Well, that, that ties in with their proposals for traffic routing anyway. So um, okay. that shouldn't Thank be you. an issue. So, Chairman, the map that we've got shows that to the south, Gretton Road is, is past the Horizon Centre, and to the west is Gretton Brook Road, which is what leads to Gretton Village itself. So that, that was, it was avoiding, okay. that was what Thank I was Thank you very intention. much for your patience with earlier. Yeah, I accept that point. That Having looked at the map, my I, I assumed Gretton Brook Road continued all around the bend, but it, it's actually labelled labeled different, differently on this map. We'll check, we'll check on that and make sure it's appropriately covered, Chair. Well, in that case, then, uh, can I suggest that if we're minded to grant this application, that the final wording of that condition be delegated to the assistant director in consultation with the, the development control manager, the chairman and the vice chairman of this committee. Are there any further comments or questions from members of the committee? No. Right. In that case, then, I'm going to move to the recommendation. Right. Uh, this concerns uh, NCC application 20 stroke 00033 stroke WAS full. There are matching uh, applications for East North Hampshire Council and Corby Borough Council. The recommendation is that planning permission is granted uh, at, in respect of this application, uh, subject to the conditions sub specified in the report, uh, together with the two amendments that three amendments that we have now put forward, namely, first of all, the additional sentence on condition three. Secondly, the uh, routing arrangement. And thirdly, Councillor Jill Mercer, you proposed something as I recall. Can you remind me what it was? In the lighting about- uh, Oh yes, the lighting, the lighting condition. Right. Are there any further suggested amendments to the motion or the conditions? No. I see no one indicating. In that case, then, I will go to the vote and I will call out the names of individual councillors one by one and ask whether they vote for, against or abstain on this motion. <clears throat> First of all, Councillor Andrew Kilbride. You're muted. You're mute. Uh, I welcome your amendments to the paper, but um, I'm against this application. Okay. Councillor Graham Lawman. Or. Councillor Rebecca Breeze. Or. Councillor Arthur McCutcheon. I don't see him anywhere. Uh, Councillor Jill Mercer. Or. Councillor Winston Strachan. Four, oh, Chair. Pardon? Four. Four, yes. Okay. Councillor Michael Ty. Four. Councillor Malcolm Waters. You're muted at the moment, Malcolm. Malcolm? <laughs> he says I four. I can't read. He said four, okay. And yes. finally, myself as Chair, Councillor Andy Mercer, I'm four. Uh, that means that the motion is carried, I believe. Okay, we will now move to item 6B, uh, which is uh, a variation to the planning consent that has already been granted for a waste facility at uh, Shelton Road. Uh, can I ask Mr. Watson to present his report, please? Thank you, Chair.
So the committee have dealt with this site previously, and most recently back in September of last year. Um, the applications for proposals to amend the building, buildings, elevations and ancillary facilities and the, and the footprint and layout of the buildings to accommodate the facilities as single line plans. This is, an, this is from the energy from waste plans. And um, it was, so it's a, it's a proposal to make amendments to the permission which you granted back in September, 2019 at this site. Um, we, list, we, we list the history in paragraph 2.8 and clearly the, it started just for reference back in 2013 when we first granted a permission for, for an energy from waste facility here. There were various changes. Back in 2016, we, there was a more substantial change to the type of facility and again in 2019. So this, so this becomes the, the fourth sort of substantial change to this facility. It kind of reflects the fact that it, it's been difficult for companies to secure the investment from the, uh, from the bank, banks, if you like, to, to build these facilities. So having granted several permissions in the county, we've never actually had one which has come to fruition. And this, this one uh, clearly is very close to coming to fruition. Uh, it would appear anyway, in relation to the latest submission. Uh, just to qualify that in, in 2019, the, the permission increased the throughput to 260,000 tonnes and it allowed the height of a building of 39.5 metres and the height of two flues of 75 metres. And in the, in the section three of the report, where we outlined the proposal, there's a big table there where we've um, li listed the, the, the changes, if you like, between the two applications. In, in relation to the, to the flues or the chimneys, as it's called here, the approved development is for two double line plant chimneys at 75 meters. And now they want one single line plant uh, or one, one flue, which would be for the single line plant of up to 75 meters. So that doesn't change, it just becomes a bit narrower as they reduce it from, from two flues to one. The building height though has gone up from 39.5 meters to 49.9. So it's just over 10 meters increase. And the footprint of the building has gone up from 7,525 square meters to 9,490. There's some other changes that listed there about the site layout, road layout and the drainage. So the, this proposal to change for the single line plant is being made primarily according to the applicant for energy efficiency reasons. And this is achieved through the reduction in the number of conveyors, fans and pumps being used in relation uh, to the proposal and having more energy available to export to customers off site. Now I did sort of question whether or not there was any measurable figures I could put in the report for you, but I don't, they weren't able to provide me with anything to that, of that extent, but it's clearly a more, according to the applicant, a more uh, efficient process as far as they're concerned. And they have a speaker from uh, the applicant's um, down chair, so you may want to uh, explore that further. In paragraph 3.3, the, the application quoted that Corby Limited has undertaken avoid, uh, advanced discussions with an experienced operator, ERF projects, uh, who've done things of a similar size and through them with engineering procurement construction contractors on the implementation of the approved consent. And they made this decision that these changes are quite crucial to make the operational perspective of the plant more efficient. Now I did send out in the pack chair a lot of um, plans of the elevations and the like. Do you need, does anybody need me to go through those or do you think you've all understood those regarding layouts, changes and heights and the like? Because there was a lot of plans. I didn't want to take up too much time. I don't see anybody indicating that they want you to go through that, Mr. Watson. Okay, well, if, if at any stage in the, in the um, 
in the presentation or during the discussion, there's a need to look at the plan. We, we obviously can do so. One of the things that they point out regarding the ex additional size of the footprint of the building is that they wanted to extend the tipping hall to enable the vehicles to undertake all manoeuvring and turning within the building and not only provide entry through one single door, whereas before they were going to have six doors and back into the building. So uh, they, they, they see that as an advantage in terms of amenity disturbance, not having to have these vehicles um, reversing out in the open. And I think that clearly would be an advantage if they just do everything within a building uh, rather than have external noise. So the reconfiguration of the internal site layout is covered uh, as well in the, in the details in the report. Just to say that this application is subject to environmental impact assessments uh, and therefore there's appropriate submissions um, that were made. Now, most of it is is as in the 2019 proposal, but, but because of the additional height, there's been a, a completely new and adjusted townscape and landscape and visual impact section of the report, which has been submitted. And I'll come to that in due course. In terms of consultations, Corby Borough Council um, provided a, a copy of their committee report and asked us to take all the sort of points that they'd raised in there into account. They do make the point that having reviewed the information, they, they consider it that this proposal has not an insubstantial impact on the character of the area and the visual amenity due to the proposed increase of the building. Uh, and the additional height and bulk of the building is considered to, to increase the degree and extent of the visual impact. And they request that the council carefully consider the impact of this increase in regard to the impact on the local area. Environmental health had no comments. There's nothing substantially changed there in, in, in environmental health terms. East Northamptonshire Council strongly object to the proposal on the grounds that the, the increased scale of the recovery plan and the increase in the bulk and the massing, and, and they feel, consider it would have a significant harmful landscape and visual impact, uh, including the harm to the special interests of, and significance of the heritage assets, namely Kirby Lodge, which is grade one listed and the grade two park, star park and gardens and Dean Park, which is grade two. Uh, and they say that views of historic England should be sought in that regard. We did seek the views of historic England and they didn't wish to offer any comments on the proposal. And they just said, suggested to seek the specialist conservation and archaeological advisors as relevant, which we did on the previous application. Uh, and the county archaeology advisor didn't have any uh, objections on the previous proposal. Uh, Britain Parish Council objects on the following grounds, traffic and highway impact, noise, smell and pollution and the height of the buildings. We had one objection from a member of the public um, and they were concerned about the fact that the that this was an incineration process, but clearly that, that principle has already been established. So just moving on, therefore, in, in, the issues really are not about the principle of the development, which is already established, but whether or not the, the um, impact on landscape, townscape and visual amenity are, are considered acceptable. And the applicant did provide a detailed landscape and visual impact assessment. Uh, looked at 19 public viewpoints around the site, including Priors Hall Park, housing development, the heritage assets at Kirby Hall and Dean Park, which have been mentioned. Uh, and they, they picked out some places where they considered there could be public views which would increase from the existing approved development. They were looking at the change from the consented development to this new higher uh, and, and larger um, building. Uh, they picked out some views from uh, one view in, in Hope Hobby Drive in Priors Hall Park, where there would be long views, and they considered that there would be an impact there from moving to moderate, major, adverse. But that's um, in the context of, an in, uh, of a residential street. Uh, they also looked at um, other areas in Corby and considered those to have a minor adverse impact. And, and so in terms of town, townscape character, what we've already got in that area of town is the, is the Rockingham Speedway circuit and we have the, uh, the Corby power station. 
It's Pal Corby's power station has flues at 70 meter high and obviously the other structures, I don't know the height of the other structures there, but they are, they are quite high as well. Um, their view in the landscape assessment is the proposed event will, will just reinforce the industrial character of the area, but overall the effect on soundscape character would be considered, has been considered in the LVIA to be neutral. But then when they look at the other areas, uh, the assessment considers the impact from Kirby Hall. Now we did provide you with a series of, well, the document was called Ac Accurate Visual Rep Representation Comparing the Consented Scheme with the Proposed Scheme, August 2020. And in respect of, of Kirby Hall, what it shows is that just the, and this, this applied previously anyway to the previous consent, that it may be possible to see the tip of the chimney less than five meters through the leafless trees in winter from a few upper floor windows of Kirby Hall. But from this, but from this viewpoint, the chimney would also now be, be narrower, but there would be no impact on, in relation to the, having any sight of the building from Kirby Hall. And you will have seen in your pack of drawings, one of them superimposes a position of where the building would be, which is hidden by the foreground of trees and the inter intervening topography, which would shield any views of Kirby Hall. And the, the appropriate gardens that are, are immediately in front of the hall, which are both listed. And the same really applies to Dean Park, that it's, it's set down in um, a, a valley, although the, it slowly rises. And there's only one point where they consider, you might see the top of a chimney from Dean Park as a result of um, the facility being constructed. And clearly that, that chimney hasn't changed in height from what was previously approved. Views outside of the park, that there would be some change there. And again, there was drawings to show that. Um, and therefore, very somewhat helpfully, I think they showed not only the existing consented development, but they showed a red line of what the outline of the proposed development would be. And then the photo included the finished full development for you to be able to see. Obviously, visual impact is a very uh, subjective matter. The, the LVIA has looked at it uh, as, as, they, as it does it, in a quantitative way as, possi as possible. Um, and the, those, that is the information which has been submitted. I mean, it's, it's our conclusion in advising you that we think that the changes are not so significant that they would justify refusal, but this is obviously a balanced matter uh, for you to take into account. And uh, it's on that basis, Chair, that, that I think we're proposing approval, but clearly you'd want to consider these matters yourself. Hit, listen to the speaker uh, and take uh, listen to the debate that takes place. Thank you, Mr. Watson. I'd like now to invite one public speaker to speak, uh, Mr. Paul Carey. Do we have Mr. Paul Carey in the waiting room? Mr. Carey, you have three minutes to speak to address the committee. You're currently muted. You have three minutes. To me, I was listening on YouTube and it seems to be a bit delayed. I can hear you now. Mr. Carey, you have three minutes to address the committee. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but there's a lot of static on the line. Okay. Well, I'm in a quiet office, so I'll be as uh, quiet as I can. There's nothing behind me or around me, but I'll start if that's okay. So, uh, good morning. My name's Paul Carey. I'm the managing director of a company called MVV Environment Limited, and we've been working with the landowner Corby Limited with a view to building and operating this energy from waste development. 
Now, we own and operate three similar facilities here in the UK and a further nine facilities in Germany where our shareholder sits. Our shareholder is actually the city of Mannheim, and owns just over 50%. So it's a bit like Northamptonshire County Council having its own energy company. Our experience spans 50 years of high efficiency energy from waste operations. Our intention has always been uh, to become a member of the community in which we operate, such as we do here in Plymouth, where I'm sitting, and in Dundee, where we also operate a similar facility. And we very much support the proposed formation of the Community Liaison Group. Since our involvement with the project, we have, um, using our experience, uh, propose a number of changes to the design, particularly, as you mentioned earlier, um, or the, uh, as was mentioned earlier, um, an enlarged and enclosed tipping hall for quieter operations. This will be a significant improvement. Um, improved traffic flow to allow um, all of the traffic visiting the site to go through one door in and out and to separate cars from vehicles. We also want to create space for a future environmental improvements such as carbon dioxide capture. And this is all based on emerging government policy and measures we are investigating in Germany. Most importantly, it's about increasing the useful energy efficiency by going to a single line with a single chimney. The increase in efficiency is driven by having fewer moving parts, which being bigger, achieve an economy of scale. The boiler design leads to a building height increase of 10 meters. For comparison, I'm speaking to you, as I said, from our Plymouth facility, where the boiler is 80% of the capacity of that proposed for Corby, but it's still a 45 meter high building. The photo montages for the Corby facility speak for themselves. Um, and we believe that the long distance views in particular is not significantly different from what is already consented. To quantify the benefit of going to a single line, and I heard that was mentioned earlier, in simple terms, it means we could supply a further approximately 2,000 homes with renewable energy from this facility, mm. a benefit that cannot be ignored in today's climate emergency. And this is on top of being able to sell competitively priced electricity via a private network to local industries, retaining local industries such as Tata or even such as Roquette, who have unfortunately decided to leave. All being well, if we get consent, we would start construction next year. This project would be funded by us and we would be very pleased to go ahead with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Right. Uh, are there any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Carey? Councillor Lawman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Carey just touched on something that's been a concern of me for this. Uh, we've had, um, this is uh, about the sixth uh, application on, on this site. None of them have been progressed. So, uh, and I um, was concerned about the viability, therefore, um, the fact that nobody was proceeding. Uh, and uh, Mr. Uh, Carey has just said that um, his company, which, uh, sorry, I didn't catch the full title of it, his company was, was funding it. Um, so um, you may, and it was slightly concerned to me because Corby Limited are obviously not in a position to fund this. So, um, so can you it, take us through the viability of the, of the site, both um, in construction and in uh, operation? Yes, sir. Um, so as I said, we are a German-owned company um, owned by a, um, a, a company in Germany called NVB Energy, um, and that is owned 50.1% by the city of Mannheim. It means we have very good credit rating, credit lines in Germany, and the way we finance these is that we borrow money in Germany, and that is guaranteed by our parent company, which has very strong credit ratings, and they then lend the money to our uh, subsidiaries here in the UK, and I'm managing director of the company, which for the avoidance of doubt is called MVV Environment Limited. So we would build the facility using our own money and money borrowed in the German banking community, guaranteed by our parent company. And we have very strong resources within the company. We're very engineering led. I'm an engineer myself. We own and operate all of our facilities here in the UK and in Germany. Um, so our operators wear our overalls. We do everything ourselves and we supervise the construction of the project. So if we were given consent, we would be looking to implement the, um, uh, 
project in 2021 next year. Thank you. Uh, have you got any further questions, uh, Councillor Lawman? Uh, thank you. That's some reassurance because uh, I was concerned about the viability of Corby Limited itself, but uh, that, that's some reassurance. Councillor Breeze. Thank you, Chair. Uh, looking at the, um, uh, the visual representations that were provided, um, some views of the building will be very prominent. Um, what consideration do you give to the colour that you um, apply to? I think it's going to be render, um, because you know, uh, other energy from waste systems we've got near here at, at Ardley, uh, the colour can be very important in um, having a, a large building disappearing into the view from a distance. Well, we... No, I don't want to use the Henry Ford example. You can have every, any colour you like, but we wouldn't propose black. Um, I think generally uh, the architect will advise is to have um, colours of whatever you like, a blue or a green or, or some other colour, but light, getting lighter as the building goes higher so that it blends into the skyline a bit more. And that's typically what we do. So our facility in Kent is like that and our facility in Dundee is like that. Um, less so here in Plymouth, which is right in the city centre. You probably can't see behind me. Maybe if I just tilt my screen, you might just make out some blocks of flats. We are very close to housing here in, um, in Plymouth. And so we had a different uh, approach to colour. That was with the encouragement of Plymouth City Council. But normally in these environments, we would have a graduating lighter colour scheme, um, starting which, with whichever colour you really prefer. Oh, well, thank you. That, that's helpful. And I would encourage our, our planning officers to consider uh, how the colour fits in with the environment. Thank you. Uh, can I ask Mr Watson whether it would be necessary to condition that or whether we can just rely upon what's been said by Mr Carey? <clears throat> Yeah, I was just looking, we did have this discussion with the applicants before they submitted that colour would be very important. And I know that the, um, the visual present, presentations that have been put forward by them at the minute just show it as a sort of a silvery grey colour. Uh, they, they don't, um, uh, they don't uh, show anything any different. So we, we've got condition 40 on the consent on page 81 of your paper document which says no fixed building structures plant or machinery shall be erected until details of the proposed location and external materials color and finishes have been submitted and approved by the waste planning authority uh, the development shall be implemented uh, there needs to be a word in there the development shall be implemented in accordance with the approved details perhaps and say it and thereafter maintained um in perpetuity yeah so um, there's a few words to go in there, but basically we've got the condition already in there to, to agree the colour. And I think that's something that I would want to uh, share with the colleagues in Corby and East Northamptonshire Council for their views on, on a final colour scheme in relation to the development. But we had talked to them about this graduated change in colour uh, through the building, which, which is used in quite a lot of... Um, buildings, the newer buildings these days. Um, whether or not everybody likes them, likes that format, I don't know. But uh, that's certainly what, what was in my mind as being an appropriate way forward. Unless it, and particularly unless any members have got a particular concern about that, um, I would leave it to being discussed with the Corby and the East Northamptonshire planners. Thank but you, the decision's Mr. there to ensure we can agree it. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Are there any further questions for Mr. Kerry? Councillor Ty. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, I, I fully support uh, Councillor Breeze's comments. That's what, having looked at these visual representations, um, particularly with regard to the views from Kirkby Hall, I did think um, uh, the chimney, for example, does stick out like a sore thumb from there. And I thought it very important that it should either be green or blue because it would be more aesthetically pleasing from the Kirkby Hall. Well, that's covered anyway. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Jill Mercer. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, obviously, the, the uh, height is uh, the thing that uh, concerns people uh, with the visual aspect. 
Um, it's quite a slope um, on the site. Um, I know slab heights were mentioned uh, previously, uh, but I haven't seen anything in, in this report. Um, is there any consideration for perhaps uh, going to the lower level of the site and, and cutting across rather than, I believe you're going to the higher level, the, the sort of upper uh, level of the site uh, that was further away from the entrance we were standing at. We were standing at the, the um, uh, on Shelton Road at the gates. Um, well, having visited the site several times myself, I know that the site is relatively flat. It, it sort of gets higher to the north, but running east-west, it's pretty much the same height along, I believe. And um, this building is necessarily long, longer than it is wider uh, by, by a significant uh, margin. It wouldn't be possible to turn it through 90 degrees. We could consider turning it through 180 degrees, but the way we've laid it out, gives, as I said in my speech, to a much better traffic flow and enables us to separate cars from vehicles. So cars belonging to members of the staff wouldn't have to mingle with heavy goods vehicles. Not really sure whether I fully understand whether... Sir, I wasn't suggesting turning it round. I was just suggesting levelling out the, the soil, uh, the, okay. the start the base, um, to the lower level of the site rather than as it sort of uh, goes up a little bit to the higher level so that yeah, it will down just like, yeah well um forgive me i can't remember the exact contours of the site but we have generally done that we would build the facility on a level base um, and we don't want to make it any higher than necessary the other thing though is we don't really want to have to um, dig out a lot of soil because that's a further environmental upset as well so we would look to try and maintain um, the, 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 stand, the level that we've already achieved um, by doing similar to what you've mentioned. Um, but at the top end on the north side, it is a bank. And on the other side of that, we have um, some green areas that we wouldn't want to disturb. So we'd have to be very careful. We wouldn't want to start putting in sheet piling and things like that. That would create more nuisance, I would suggest, than uh, just leaving the little contours there. OK, thank you. Are there any further questions for Mr. Carey? No. Okay, well, thank you very much for your attendance, Mr. Carey. Uh, okay. I'll now ask the Development Control Manager if he's got any further comments he would like to make before we open up to member comments. Yeah, just on that last point that Councillor uh, Jill Mercer asked, um, I think Mr. Bolton pointed out on the site visit that this this area had all, had all been... Um, previously disturbed by the steelworks and there's there's a general um you know the Corby Borough Council are very concerned about excavations taking place in relation to this to this and any other land in that area where there were, were various um toxic ponds and the things in the past I'm not suggesting that this area was, was necessarily a toxic pond but there was a lot of um res residue from the steelworks so I think that um the changing levels that would be would be uh, could result from from reducing it would be not very significant, and that the the implications for moving the materials and, and excavating would probably be something that would ought to be avoid avoided. So I, I don't think the council has had a problem in, in with the last application in the in the levels that were proposed. So I would suggest that that um, what they're now proposing, which won't have changed, is is still acceptable. Other, other than that, Chairman, I think that uh, really you've, you know, you've asked questions in relation to the proposal. Uh, I don't think there's anything I've got to come back on unless there's any questions for me. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Are there any questions for Mr. Watson before members? Yeah. Oh, Councillor Jill Mouser. Uh, just a, a small query on the um, uh, entrances. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it's not. I, it's good that they're doing the um, change to uh, um, have uh, the uh, cars separated from HGVs, etc. But on page 53, it says, um, and its own dedicated entrance off shelter mode. Does that mean there are two entrances off shelter mode or is it, is it just one? I was just going to look at the map just to see, I, I mean, just to make sure what, what the map shows. Not that many drawings here, I just need to find the right one. I'm 
looking at the site plan, which shows, well, it basically shows a, a, an in and out system, but it's just the one entrance. Ah, that's right. No, I'm with you. It shows one entrance for the for the HGVs coming in out, and a little bit further along Shelton Road, an entrance for the car park for the for the employees. So that would be there would be two. Uh, do you want me to? So presumably, highways uh, are happy with that because they they quite often don't like two entrances for uh, sites. Yeah, the highways have seen all these drawings. They did ask for some amendments to the uh, to the car parking layout to get the appropriate widths for the car parking bays and the like. So they've, they've looked at these very closely. And um, you've got to remember that Shelton Road isn't a through road anymore. Uh, it comes, it's a truncated end, not roughly where we parked. Um, and, and I think that's, there's not intention to open that road beyond that point anyway. So it doesn't give the same issues that it would be if it was a through road. The other thing is I saw somewhere that it said about uh, there ought to be a master plan for this area so that uh, things weren't done piecemeal. Has that ever been looked into? I'm just trying to think where you might have seen that comment. I can't remember where I saw it because when I went to look for it again, I couldn't find it. But I, uh, I... Well, I mean, I think that clearly it's Corby Borough Council's as the local planning authority to deal with any sort of plans, plans at that level in terms of master planning. Um, and there is permission already, I believe, in place or, or at least allocation for more of the land to the east of this site to be developed for um, commercial sort of industrial uses. So there is obviously some sort of plan already existing in, in Corby in relation to that. What I didn't say earlier on, which is slightly moving off your point, uh, Councillor Mercer, is that part of that land further to the east has there's a separate planning application being made by the company for a construction compound to uh, facilitate the construction of this facility. Um, and that clearly is another indicator of how, in their opinion, uh, and the evidence that they're close to being able to proceed to, to construct a development if, if they get the appropriate planning permission. They have one at the minute, but clearly they're seeking what they consider to be an improved system, which um, you've heard the explanation as to why we provide um, additional energy to um, potentially 2,000 homes. Thank you. Right, uh, now I'll open it up for members. I'll start by making the uh, comment that there is an extant planning consent on this site and it has been instantiated by them uh, putting down some foundations at the gatehouse so that is a live planning consent that will not expire. So we are merely looking at a change in the uh, details of the planning consent, not the principle. Mm. Uh, having said that, I'll open it up to members for comments. Wow, nothing. Uh, Council Lawman. I wasn't. Um, I think my uh, my only concern with this is the mass of the building itself and the place. Uh, there is a comment in one of the documents um, that from Hobby Drive, which I don't know, it's a residential street within Price Hall. There is major adverse effect. Um, in uh, this is the landscape and visual impact assessment. I'm actually reading one of the documents. Um, so, uh, and I think that that's my major concern. I am as a slight. Uh, aside, I'm pleased to see that in the latest site plan, they put four electric vehicle charging points in the car park, given what this site is intended to do. Um, but uh, um, I think um, having had the assurance about the um, viability of the site, because they keep on doing these uh, applications whilst we're obviously pleased to receive the fees, um, it, just, it, it, it just keeps giving uncertainty to people if these things are not um, implemented. Um, so I think I shall be um, supporting this, but to, with a, a heavy heart, given the mass of the building. Councillor Jill Mercer. Thank you. Um, yes, obviously that mass is um, a concern, but I've looked carefully at the, uh, the pictures and the um, mock-ups. In fact, uh, Councillor Lorman just mentioned the Hobby Drive. That's in the pack. There's a, 
uh, a now and a proposed uh, one. And um, where you can see it, it um, it doesn't seem as um, you know as bad as uh, that description that you just said. Um, uh, you know, I forget what the wording was now, but uh, uh, very very great impact. Um, so I think the the fact that it's um, more efficient. Um, the vehicles are, are safer. Um, and the uh, uh, building is going to uh, uh, have just uh, one uh, line rather than two. It's only got one uh, chimney rather than two. Um, I think the the fact that it is uh, fairly uh, the mass of the building um, is uh, something that uh, just. Uh, we will have to um, support because it makes it more efficient. Are there any further comments? Uh, Councillor Breeze. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I live quite close to the Ardley Energy from Waste System, which was hugely controversial at the time and was built out maybe eight, nine years ago. And again, it's a, a very, very large massed building on a on a flat landscape. But we have to put these buildings somewhere. We have got to, we've got to deal with our waste problem. There is an extant uh, permission. Mm -hmm. And certainly in terms of the local community, the Ardley facility has sort of settled into the landscape um, and, uh, and, and works and the controversy has died down. So um, as there's an extant um, permission and with the reassurances we've heard from the applicant, I'm minded to um, approve it. Thank you. Uh, further comments by anybody? Councillor Ty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I haven't got any experience of uh, an engineering background at all, but in terms of um, the, the reasons that uh, Mr. Carey gave with regard to efficiency in the environment, whilst I am not completely content with the size of the building, um, I am very much inclined to uh, support what he's doing or his company's doing. Thank you, Councillor Ty. Any further comments by members? I think I would summarise it by saying that they've already got permission, they've already started, and they this actually, from a distance, is slight, a slight improvement over the existing one because it's one stack instead of two. Closer up, it's slightly worse, because the centre of the building is bigger. Uh, but uh, that's uh, about it, I think. Right, if there are no further comments, uh, I will go to the vote. And as before, I will call out the names of the members and ask whether they're in favour of the uh, building going ahead. I will first of all read out what we're voting on. That the application number... 20 stroke 00048 stroke WAS WOC uh, be approved subject to the append to the conditions in Appendix A to the officer's report that was submit, circulated. Right. Councillor Andrew Kilbride. Kilbride. Yeah, Chairman, Chairman uh, with the slight uh, amendment that uh, Mr. Watson mentioned earlier on. Yes, correct. Thank you, Councillor Jill Mercer. Uh, we will be uh, voting on the um, slightly amended conditions. Uh, Councillor Kilbride. Aye. Uh, okay. Councillor Lawman. Approve. Yeah. Councillor Breeze. Four. Councillor McCutcheon is not present. Councillor Jill Mercer. Four. Councillor Strachan. Four. Councillor Ty. Four. Councillor Walters. Four. And uh, as Chairman, Councillor Andy Mercer, I'm for it, so that's unanimous. And that is uh, granted subject to the amended conditions. Right. Now we move on to item 6C. Uh, Mr. Watson, would you like to present your report? Thank you, Chairman. This is the list of the current uh, and determined minerals and waste plan applications since the last committee. 
So we start on, I've got paper copy here, page 85, which uh, lists the current outstanding ones that we have submitted. There's just one on that page at the moment. Uh, moving on to page 86, we have the Ingraborn Valley applications, which you, have, you dealt with at the last committee, but are awaiting a legal agreement, so they still remain on the list. Progress is being made, I, I could say, with that legal agreement. And just also to say that we are um, in liaison with the parish council. Obviously, they were disappointed uh, in the decision. And we have set up meetings to start to discuss and um, build up some, uh, some relationships regarding their concerns. Uh, first meeting is going to take place this week. And we will obviously be, be in due course introducing the applicants into the environment, uh, sorry, into the liaison forum to, to discuss things as we go forward, particularly in relation to the crossing of Bridalway PD1, which you remember was an issue which we, um, which we picked up and we strengthened the planning condition in, in relation to that. Uh, so there's more on page 87, Chair. Um, we've got the, at the bottom of page 87, two applications for the varying the conditions at the work, working hours at Wakeley Quarry, which we nearly brought to you in the last committee. We haven't brought it to you this time. Uh, there's still ongoing further monitoring that the applicants are doing uh, and other meetings taking place with the local community about that. So I don't expect we'll get it to you for the, for the meeting in, in January, but we, we really need to try and get it to you in February. What we will need to do is try and arrange another date to go out there for any members who can travel to go and witness the, the, um, the quarry and the activities and obviously go around to the various villages who were concerned, concerned about uh, noise from the site. But we'll we should have more monitoring information to help feed into that report. So the report could get, it, could get adjusted at any, at any rate. Uh, moving on, then there's there's more applications with dealing with on page 88. I won't say anything about any of those at the moment. Uh, and then page 89, unless members have got any questions. And then we've got several that are awaiting validation that are listed mm -hmm. as well. The bottom of page 89 to page 90. Members have got any other questions on any of those applications? I'll try and answer them. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Lawman. Thank you, Chairman. Page eighty-seven, application seventeen. Um, <clears throat> uh, that's been uh, under consideration of responses for some time, and I'm just slightly concerned that um, we, uh, that we've got a, a written uh, agreement to extend because the applicant could, of course, go for determination for uh, go to to the planning inspector for non-determination um, and. Uh, I, I, so I'd just like an update of w where we were and just be assured that um, we've got this uh, the written agreement to extend. We have we have been in uh, contact in the agent regarding this matter. And there's an outstanding issue relating a technical issue relating to the Environment Agency and flood the risk matters, which we've been waiting for information for from the applicant. Um, I just I can't give you an answer in the meeting as to whether or not we formally got their permission, but they know the situation. There should be absolutely no reason why they are not willing to agree to an extension, because as I say, they, they know that they're, they're having to provide this further information, uh, which has been requested by the Environment Agency. I can let Councillor Lawman know outside the meeting, if that's okay, Chair, precisely where, well, and the rest of you, of the members, know what the position is. But I think you can be rest assured that there's not an issue in terms of them going for non-determination. We're in discussion with them. Okay, can you uh, circulate you. Perhaps, that information? Yeah, perhaps the, uh, the division councillor could be uh, kept informed as well, because uh, he's, he's made representations to me. Yeah, that's... Another. Are there any further questions for Mr. Watson on this item? <clears throat> okay, we're only asked to note this item. Uh, therefore, I'll move on to the next item on the agenda. 
which is item seven. Mm -hmm. Item 7, page 93 on the uh, officer report. <coughs> Chairman, this uh, is a much shorter list because this is the Regulation 3 applications. Uh, as you can see, we've only got two on that page to do with um, a couple of schools. Uh, and one on the following page and one waiting validation which is very minor anyway it's a non-material amendment i have to say you know other than the, the fact that we got dealt with the road scheme a couple of committees ago uh, and we <laughs> we've got very ap few applications relating to regulation three these days with all the schools being academies pretty well anyway most of them um and um so they don't expect there'd be very many more before um, we obviously become two new authorities in due course. So I've got nothing unless there's any questions, Chair. Are there any questions on this item for Mr. Watson? No. no. Okay, well, this is once again one just for noting, so I'm not going to call for a vote on it. We just move on to item eight. Chair, well, there's absolutely no, nothing to report on Town and Village Greens, but just for the record, we've just brought you this uh, paper just to demonstrate that there's nothing and we haven't forgotten about them. Okay, then. Well, that's once again an item for noting, not for uh, any vote. Uh, there is no, uh, There are no urgent items of business that have been notified to me as Chairman of the Committee. Therefore, we have reached the end of the agenda. Uh, I'm therefore proposing to declare the meeting closed. Thank you everybody for your attendance uh, and I look forward to seeing you all again in the new year. Stay safe, don't take any silly chances over the next few weeks. Thank you, Goodbye. Thank you. And Christmas everybody, happy Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. Thank you officers. Bye, Merry Christmas. Do you get my note, Andy? Do you need work with me, Phil, or can I go? I don't. I don't think we do. I just look. Roy's just um, next door. I'll just ask him. It, Okay. Yeah. Um, no, Is there anything we need from Jenny? Because she's just asking me. Is everybody um, else has closed out. Not that I'm aware of. Um, I don't think so. Is it? Okay. No, we don't think so, Jenny. I mean, we we don't know um, whether we'll have an agenda for January at the moment, but we'll have to assume we possibly could. Do you think you could book these rooms just in case? Yeah, I think I have booked MO1 and MO2, but I'll, I'll check right now and I'll book them again. Thank you. Other than that, yeah, thanks for your help. Thanks, Jenny. And thanks, thanks. Uh, Paul was involved at some stage, wasn't he? Thank, thanks to him as yep. well.